Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is, as always, a great pleasure to welcome the Secretary General back to, to Washington, back to the State Department. Jens, uh, so good to be with you. Um, before I begin, and uh, with your permission, I just want to briefly update everyone on our efforts to assist Turkey and Syria in the aftermath of Monday's earthquakes. Um, the loss of life has been truly staggering, shocking. Um, we, uh, I think, along with uh, people around the world, are mourning those who have been lost, and uh, also our thoughts are so with those who have lost uh, loved ones. Um, so far, we have deployed more than 150 search and rescue personnel to Turkey. We have U.S. helicopters that are helping to reach areas that would otherwise be difficult to access. Uh, in Syria, we have NGO partners that uh, we funded over the years that are providing life-saving assistance to those in need. Across both countries, uh, we've deployed experienced emergency managers, hazardous materials technicians, engineers, logisticians, paramedics, planners, others, along with about 170,000 pounds of specialized tools and equipment. Uh, so that's been the initial response. Uh, in the days ahead, we'll, we'll have more to say about how we'll continue to support both uh, the Turkish and Syrian people as they work to recover from this devastation. Uh, turning back to today, uh, the Secretary General and I were last together in November uh, for the NATO Foreign Ministers meeting. The members of our alliance left that meeting in Bucharest even more unified, more resolute, and more committed in our support for Ukraine, which is in large part uh, due to the remarkable leadership that Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, has engaged in uh, over, uh, over the last year. During what has been a decisive time for NATO and for the world, his strong and steady hand uh, has helped steer our alliance in the right direction. Uh, now, as we approach the one-year mark uh, since President Putin launched his brutal war against Ukraine, it's critical that we maintain and increase that support. Uh, President Putin's war continues to be a strategic failure. He's failed to overthrow the democratically elected government of Ukraine. He's failed to subsume Ukraine into Russia or to break the will of its people. He's lost the battles for Kyiv, for Kharkiv, for Kherson. His military is suffering staggering losses on the battlefield. And he's failed to weaken our alliance and what it stands for. In fact, that alliance, NATO, is stronger and more united than it's ever been. Uh, today, we focused on steps that we can take to ensure that Ukraine has the security assistance that it needs to defend its territory against Russian aggression. And we'll continue that conversation this afternoon when we're joined by the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, and the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, here at the State Department. Uh, we've calibrated our assistance to meet Ukraine's changing needs from the outside of the Russian invasion, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. Uh, two weeks ago, President Biden announced that the United States would send Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Germany committed to send its Leopard tanks and authorize other partners to do the same. Uh, this followed the earlier announcement by the United Kingdom that it would be sending Challenger 2 tanks to Ukraine's defenders. Last week, uh, we also announced two new assistance packages, uh, which will provide critical air defense and counter drone capabilities to help Ukraine defend its people, including against the threat posed by UAVs supplied by Iran, which shares Russia's authoritarian vision and is increasingly aiding and abetting its aggression. We're also providing armored infantry vehicles and more of the equipment that Ukraine is using so effectively, like Javelin anti-tank missiles, artillery ammunition, and rockets for U.S.-provided HIMARS. In total, the United States has committed nearly $30 billion since the beginning of Russia's invasion, and our allies and partners have provided more than $13 billion in military assistance over the past year and tens of billions more in humanitarian and economic support. The contributions that uh, Europe uh, writ large has made uh, to this effort uh, are very significant and um, making a profound difference. As President Zelensky has said, diplomacy is the only way to definitively end Russia's war of aggression and to create a path to peace that is both just and durable. Clearly, President Putin has no genuine interest in diplomacy right now. Here's what he said just a few weeks ago. Unless and until Ukraine accepts the new territorial realities, in quotation marks, there is nothing to even talk about. In other words, Ukraine and the world must somehow acquiesce to President Putin's land grab. That should be a non-starter for every country in the world that cares about the UN Charter and preserving international peace and security. The best way to hasten prospects for real diplomacy is to keep tilting the battlefield in Ukraine's favor. 
This will help ensure that Ukraine has the strongest possible hand to play at a negotiating table when one emerges. We also discussed the systemic and tactical challenges that China presents to the alliance and the broader international system. Uh, last week, Beijing violated international law and U.S. sovereignty with the presence of a Chinese surveillance balloon in U.S. airspace. This was an irresponsible act, in response to which we acted responsibly and prudently to protect our interests. Um, there is an ongoing operation to recover the balloon's components. Uh, we're analyzing them to learn more about the surveillance program. We'll pair that with what we learned from the uh, balloon itself, what we learned from the balloon itself, with what we gleaned based on our careful observation of the system when it was in our airspace, as the President directed his team to do. Now, we'll also share relevant findings with Congress as well as with our allies and partners around the world. Senior administration officials are on the Hill this week, and we already shared information with dozens of countries around the world, both from Washington and through our embassies. But we're doing so because the United States was not the only target of this broader program, which has violated the sovereignty of countries across five continents. Uh, in our engagements, uh, we are again hearing from our partners that the world expects China and the United States to manage our relationship responsibly. That's precisely what we set out to do. We continue to urge China to do the same. We're also continuing to strengthen and broaden NATO's partnerships and weave them together in new ways. The United States welcomed the Secretary General's visit to South Korea and Japan last week as an extension of those efforts, demonstrating the growing synergy between our Atlantic and Pacific alliances. And of course, we're very focused on the accession of Sweden and Finland to NATO. These countries are ready to bring their strengths to bear on our alliance. They're capable, they're trusted partners, they're strong democracies that are dedicated to the values that underpin the alliance. We'll continue to push for the completion of this process as we head toward the Vilnius Summit in July. And as we look to Vilnius, uh, our alliance is working to operationalize the strategic concept to make sure that NATO is fit for the future, including on challenges like emerging technologies, cyber defense, climate and energy security. These were all significant achievements uh, under the uh, leadership of Secretary General Stoltenberg in bringing forward uh, and having approved a new strategic concept for the alliance to reflect the realities of the moment we're living in and to project uh, what we need to do into the future. So it's a busy time, but we're confident about what our alliance can achieve, uh, confident because of the great unity that we've shown again and again over the last year and confident because of the shared purpose we bring to the year and the years ahead. With that, Jens, over to you. Secretary Blinken, there, Tony, it's great to be back in Washington and uh, to be together with you again. I would like to start uh, by commending President Biden and the United States for providing such uh, strong leadership at a time when we face the most serious security crisis uh, in a generation. And thank you, Tony, uh, for your personal commitment and your leadership uh, on every issue related to NATO and uh, the vital bond between America and uh, Europe. Unwavering American leadership and bipartisan support have ensured that NATO allies are united uh, like never before. And our unity makes a real difference. President Putin launched his illegal war or aggression almost a year ago. Since then, uh, NATO allies have provided unprecedented support for Ukraine. Around $120 billion in military, humanitarian and financial assistance. As the biggest ally, the United States is playing an indispensable role in supporting uh, Ukraine. European NATO allies and Canada have stepped up as well contributing over half of the overall assistance, including tanks, advanced uh, air defense systems, and other military equipment. Europeans have also welcomed almost five million refugees from uh, Ukraine, applied unprecedented sanctions, and decoupled from Russian gas and Russian oil. This shows how much we can do when Europe and North America stand together. Today, we discussed the situation in Ukraine. Putin started this war of aggression, and he can end this war today by withdrawing his troops from Ukraine and coming to the negotiating table. 
But regrettably, we see no sign that Russia is preparing for peace. On the contrary, Moscow is preparing for new military offensives. So we must continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons it needs to retake territory and prevail as a sovereign independent nation. If Putin wins, it will be a tragedy for Ukraine, but it will also be dangerous for all of us. It will send a clear message, not just to Putin, but also to other authoritarian regimes, that when they use force, they can achieve their goals. That will make the world more dangerous and all of us more vulnerable. Beijing is watching closely and learning lessons that may influence its future decisions. So what happens in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. China is substantially building up its military forces, including nuclear weapons without any transparency. It is attempting to assert control over the South China Sea and threatening Taiwan trying to take control of critical infrastructure, including in NATO countries, repressing its own citizens and trampling on human rights, and deepening its strategic partnership with Moscow. So NATO allies have real concerns, which we discussed today. In this more dangerous and uh, more competitive world, we must continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense and further increase defense spending. And that is what we are doing. In 2014, under the Obama-Biden administration, all NATO allies agreed the Defense Investment Pledge. Since then, we have seen eight consecutive years of increased defense spending across Europe and Canada. With an additional 350 million extra US dollar spent. More countries are now spending at least 2% of GDP uh, on defense. And I expect that trend to continue. Today, we also discussed the importance of completing Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO. At the Madrid summit last July, all allies made a historic decision to invite both countries to join NATO. All allies have signed the accession protocols, and 28 allies have already ratified the agreement. Finland and Sweden are now being integrated into the civilian and military structures of our alliance. This has already strengthened their security, and it is inconceivable that allies would not act should Finland or Sweden come under pressure. It is important that we conclude this membership, uh, membership process as soon as possible. This will strengthen the security of all allies. So, Secretary Blinken, dear Tony, thank you again for your strong personal commitment and uh, for the extraordinary leadership of the United States as we face global challenges together. Now turn to questions. We will start with Leon Bruno of the AFP. Uh, um, hi there, Mr. Secretary and Secretary General. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, Mr. Secretary, you, you started the press conference uh, speaking about the tragic earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And actually, that's my, my question is relevant to that. Um, specifically, uh, as you know, there's a uh, one border crossing in the northwest of Syria, which is damaged by the earthquake, and there are no other crossings, and so obviously it's going to be difficult to, to get the aid there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also said that uh, you were adamant in saying that uh, all U.S. aid would go through NG local NGOs, mm -hmm. um, U.S.-funded local mm -hmm. NGOs. And so my question is this, is I was wondering if the administration has had any contact at any level with the Syrian government and if there were a request through the Syrian government, would the U.S. The administration accede to that request to coordinate aid for the <coughs> Syrian people? And uh, 
question from the Secretary General, um, since Turkey is obviously a, a NATO member. Um, could you provide us some detail on what NATO is actually doing uh, to help uh, the recovery efforts in uh, Turkey? And also, tragically, um, uh, would this tragedy in any way uh, help to ease tensions with uh, Turkey uh, on the relevant issues that you mentioned uh, on your agenda? Thank you very right. much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, with regard to Syria, I'm not aware of any contacts between the uh, United States government and the Syrian government in, uh, in recent days uh, since the, the earthquake. Um, but here's what, um, here's what we've been doing. If you go back to 2011, we provided more than $15 billion in assistance to the Syrian people through uh, NGO partners, international NGO partners, partners on the ground in Syria. Um, we're a leading provider of uh, humanitarian assistance to Syria, to the Syrian people, not uh, to the government. And working through these partners, um, we've tried to make sure that the assistance gets to uh, where it's needed. And that's the people who are uh, affected by the horrific uh, war that uh, Assad has waged on his own people since 2011. And now, in the case of the earthquake, to people affected uh, by the earthquake. Uh, you're exactly right that uh, there is one crossing that um, allows assistance to get into Syria from the, from the outside, and that was disrupted by the earthquake. It's exactly why we have been fighting every single year, not only to preserve that crossing, uh, at the, it's authorized, as you know, by the United Nations, but to get additional ones uh, so that if a crossing was taken out of action, uh, there would be uh, other places that people could get humanitarian assistance in. And of course, year after year, uh, Russia has sought to block those crossings or to limit them. And that only compounds the tragedy that people in Syria are now experiencing. Just a couple of hours after the earthquake, uh, we sent out a, a call uh, from the NATO headquarters to all NATO allies uh, to provide uh, immediate uh, support uh, to help uh, uh, Turkey with uh, uh, the consequences of the devastating earthquake. And, uh, uh, I welcome that um, allies have stepped up and are now providing different types of uh, support. Uh, of course, the U.S., as Secretary Blinken mentioned, has already provided a lot of support, but also other allies are uh, stepping up, uh, and, uh, and that's the continued message from, uh, from NATO, is that uh, uh, we should support Turkey, uh, a valued and important NATO ally, where we see uh, human suffering and, uh, and the devastating consequences of the uh, earthquake. Uh, and of course, allies have also expressed their deepest uh, condolences, um, and uh, um, it is uh, uh, heartbreaking to see uh, all the suffering, but also uh, uh, to see how uh, people and allies are now stepping up to provide as much help as possible. Tova Birogas, NRK. Question for uh, Secretary Blinken. Uh, how important is it for the Biden administration that Sweden is also allo allowed to join NATO, not just Finland? And what is the U.S. doing to solve this, this argument with Erdogan and Turkey? What, how can the U.S. influence uh, that Turkey changes its position? Thank you. Uh, well, first, this is not a bilateral issue between the United States and any other uh, country. Um, this is a, an alliance matter, and our view uh, is, is very clear. Both Finland and Sweden uh, are ready to be NATO allies, uh, and the alliance should welcome them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, their militaries already work seamlessly with, uh, with alliance forces. As I said earlier, they're strong, vibrant democracies. Uh, we're confident that NATO will formally uh, welcome both countries and that that will happen soon. Uh, and this will, in turn, enhance security across the entire Euro-Atlantic region. Um, as this process continues, we are fully committed to Finland and Sweden's accession uh, to the alliance. Um, and again, I think you can see the strength of that support across uh, the alliance. Nearly all countries took swift action. Uh, our Senate overwhelmingly and on a bipartisan basis voted for their membership. And the time is right uh, now to finalize that accession process and to welcome as full members uh, of NATO. Uh, we support the uh, work that um, both countries have been doing with Turkey to address legitimate concerns that Turkey has brought to the table uh, about its security. Uh, there is an ongoing process there, but as you know, uh, both countries, Finland and Sweden, took significant steps to address concerns 
that, uh, that Turkey raised. They made commitments under uh, a memorandum of agreement that was signed in Madrid, uh, and uh, they are making good on, um, uh, on the commitments that they've made. Uh, again, we acknowledge uh, Turkey's longtime security concerns. We appreciate the tangible actions that both countries, Finland and Sweden, have taken uh, to address them. Nick Schifrin of PBS. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, forgive me, two questions uh, for you, and then I'll turn to the Secretary General. Uh, today, the British Prime Minister uh, announced that the UK would uh, provide uh, fighter jet training, Western fighter jet training, uh, to Ukrainian pilots and would examine the possibility of providing Western jets to Ukraine. Why does the US continue to oppose uh, a step that the British government uh, now believes would be helpful to Ukraine long term? Uh, and on the balloon, you've described now the network uh, of uh, aerial surveillance conducted by uh, China uh, in five continents. Uh, do you believe that that uh, network is run by the PLA Air Force, and do you believe Xi Jinping himself was aware of the balloon last week? Uh, and Mr. Secretary General, uh, U.S. officials have described uh, that Chinese surveillance balloons uh, have flown over uh, at least one European country. Uh, is that something that NATO is aware of, uh, and are you concerned about? Thank you. Um, thanks very much. So, uh, first of all, with regard to uh, the balloon, uh, we will have more to say about that in the uh, in the days ahead. We are getting more information uh, almost by the hour as we continue to work uh, to salvage the balloon. We're learning uh, from that, uh, and as well, uh, we're learning from um, what uh, we saw and picked up as the balloon traversed uh, the, uh, the United States. Uh, as to who's responsible for that, <laughs> um, China is. And it doesn't matter uh, on one level which individuals may or may not have been, um, have been responsible. The fact is China engaged uh, in this irresponsible action, a violation of our, our sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, and. Um, international law. And as we've noted as well, uh, we're not alone in this. Uh, countries across five continents have also had surveillance balloons overfly uh, their territory, which is why we're sharing this information with others. We continue to look to China to act responsibly uh, and uh, as well to, ma to, to help us in managing this relationship responsibly. That's what we continue uh, to look for. Um, and I'm sorry, the first part of your question? Oh, the fighter jets. Um, as we've said throughout this process, every single turn we will, working very closely with the Ukrainians, uh, as well as working with other uh, partners and allies, um, work to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs, when it needs it to effectively defend itself, and to continue to take back the territory that's been seized from it by Russian forces. As the nature of the, uh, of the conflict the aggression has evolved, so too is the support that we provided. Uh, and what we did initially, in fact, before the Russian aggression uh, itself, as we, saw, as we saw it coming and wanted to make sure that Ukraine had in its hands what it would need to defend itself, uh, we did these very significant drawdowns um, a year, you know, in, um, more than, well, more than a year ago, a year and a half ago, back uh, in September before the aggression, uh, Christmas before the aggression. And as a result, they had things like stingers and javelins on hand when Russia went at Kyiv, and they were able to repel the attack and, and, and push it back. At every step along the way, uh, as needs have evolved, so too is what we have provided uh, Ukraine, and that uh, most recently um, took place with the uh, decision to provide the Abrams tanks, and of course Germany providing uh, the Leopard tanks and other Europeans doing the same. We've also been very clear all along that what's vital is not just a particular weapon system, piece of equipment. Equally important is the ability of Ukrainians to use it effectively, and that requires, in some cases, significant training. Uh, equally important is the ability to maintain it. And then finally, all of that has to be brought together in an actually, uh, in, a, in, a, in a coherent uh, strategy. All of those elements are important. It, it's a long way of saying this, this is an evolving uh, process, and we will continue to make uh, judgments about what we think Ukraine needs and what uh, it can be most effective uh, in using. We'll do that in very close consultation with the Ukrainians and, of course, in consultation with our partners. 
The Chinese uh, balloon over uh, the United States uh, confirms a pattern of Chinese behavior, where we see that uh, China over the last years has invested heavily in new uh, military capabilities, including uh, different types of uh, uh, surveillance and intelligence uh, platforms. And uh, uh, we have also seen um, increased Chinese intelligence activities uh, in Europe. Uh, again, different platforms. Um, um, they use uh, satellites, uh, they, they, they use cyber, uh, 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 and as we've seen over the United States, uh, also balloons. So, so we just have to be vigilant. We need to be aware of uh, the constant risk of uh, Chinese intelligence and uh, uh, then step up what we do to protect uh, ourselves. Uh, uh, and we need uh, also to react in a, uh, in a prudent, uh, uh, responsible and vigilant way, as we have seen and the United States uh, has reacted to this uh, specific uh, balloon over uh, North America and the United uh, States. Um, I think it also highlights that uh, security is not regional. Security is global. Uh, what happens in Asia matters for Europe, and what happens in uh, Europe matters for Asia, uh, and, uh, and also, of course, for North America. This was a message that was very much confirmed during my visit to Japan and South Korea, uh, East Asia, last week, uh, where uh, uh, those close partners of, uh, of NATO very much highlighted the importance of uh, strengthening the cooperation between NATO uh, uh, and, uh, and our partners in, in, in uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, to address the challenges that uh, uh, China um, poses to our security, to our values and, uh, and to our interests. And I think that this, uh, the balloon over North America just confirms that pattern. Let's take a final question from Karen Erickson of ND. Thank you very much. So um, back to Turkey then, because Turkey is now sending the signal that it might accept Finland but not Sweden into NATO, separating the processes. I wanted to ask you both, to what extent do you see this as a possible or viable path forward? Thank you. First of all, I think we have to remember that all allies, uh, also Turkey, made uh, an historic decision in July last year when all allies at the NATO summit in Madrid uh, invited both Finland and Sweden to become members of the alliance. Then all allies, all 30 allies, uh, signed the accession protocols and so far uh, already 28 out of 30 allies have ratified the accession protocols. Uh, these are historic decisions. Um, uh, and uh, so far this has been uh, uh, one of the quickest uh, uh, accession processes in NATO's uh, history, uh, uh, the quickest in NATO's modern history, uh, because we have to remember that Finland and Sweden applied in May last year, and only in July they were invited, and, and, uh, and now 28 out of 30 uh, ha have uh, ratified the, uh, the, the protocols. They applied together, uh, they were invited together, um, and. Um, and, and, and 28 allies have already signed uh, both uh, protocols. Um, I think it's important that we uh, uh, recognize the, uh, the importance both for Finland and Sweden, but also for, for the whole alliance, uh, that uh, they become a member, uh, became, that they will become members as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, as part of the decision in um, in, uh, in Madrid, uh, Finland, Sweden, and uh, Turkey signed a joint memorandum um, on how to step up cooperation, uh, not least uh, in the fight against terrorism. Uh, Finland and Sweden uh, have uh, delivered on their commitments under that uh, memorandum. I also uh, expressed that view in my meetings with the Turkish leadership. Uh, so I'm confident that uh, both will become a member, but I'm not uh, ready to go into exactly when that will happen. Um, what he said. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.